What's up guys, this is Chris with Cowdog, and today I'm gonna to be showing you how to make this Japanese and shaker inspired writing desk complete with continuous grain aprons and drawer fronts, a hand turned pole, as well as a really unique Japanese carpentry joint that'll accent one of the legs. Stick around and check it out. This desk was inspired by a video I saw from John Peters on making an entryway table, as well as a joint I learned from Japanese carpenter Dylan Iwakuni through the Florida School of Woodwork. Now Shaker Furniture is known for its minimalist design, and this desk lends itself to that for the most part, with hard maple as the primary wood. A few slight embellishments break away from tradition, with some contrasting pieces in rosewood and ebony. In an effort to have one continuous grain front, I started by ripping down all four aprons and then cross-cutting what will be the front apron into two apron pieces and a drawer face. You might notice on my table saw that I have this base for a magnetic dial indicator. I use that as a stop against my fence to be able to make repeatable cuts without worrying about my workpiece binding between the blade and the fence and potential kickback. Since I've cut my apron into three pieces, it'll need to be mounted to a substrate, so I'm ripping two strips which will be glued to the back of the apron with the drawer face removed. This is a recipe for having glue squeeze out taint your end grain, so a bit of extra diligence in the cleanup will serve you during the finishing process later. And you can also note here that I'm using the drawer face as a positioning block in the middle to ensure that I nail the spacing of the apron components for that continuous grain look. Onto the legs, I started by measuring off the piece of rosewood I had and made a quick mistake by attempting to rip with my unsurfaced side against the fence. My buddy Mike surfaced these two S3S for me, so I needed to run the jointed side along the fence to keep everything square. But since I'm cutting one of the pieces of maple stock shorter than the others anyway, it was a bit of a no harm, no foul situation. As an accent, I'm going to attempt to pronounce and complete Juji Meshigai Sugi for one of the front legs. This Japanese carpentry joint is extremely reminiscent of a castle joint, except it actually joins two vertical pieces in a cross-shaped mortise and tenon. As another break from tradition, Japanese carpenters use pen to do their layout, whereas I'll be using a marking gauge and marking knife to scribe lines into the wood. The idea for both sides is that you'll be marking out an equal 9 square grid on the end grain and a corresponding 3 square grid on the faces. I'm sawing the male tenon first, doing a nibbling crosscut just to the middle lines. You can see that as I'm sawing, I'm stopping to blow out dust so that I can make sure that I'm staying true and plumb. Then switching to a rip tooth dovetail saw, I'll do a similar cut but vertically. I like to use my thumbnail in my marking line, which forces my saw kerf into the waist. To remove the waste, I chop down across the fibers with a chisel and then into the end grain to pop out the bulk, all while respecting my layout lines. Starting from the outside corner and working your way in and down is easiest as those will have less connection to the rest of the piece due to your saw lines. With that roughed out, I'll start sawing out the mortise. I'll start with one channel mortise, sawing from both sides at an angle until I reach my baseline. When you flip to the other side, the general idea is to have your saw lines meet at an apex in your end grain. After that, you can saw straight down to get the remaining material in the kerf line. And much like before, you're going to chop out your waste across the wood grain and pop it out from the end grain. I would also suggest going halfway and flipping to preserve the integrity of your faces. And with the waste hammered out, you can start sawing your next channel, and I do that in the same way as before. Since I'll be at this for a second, please take a moment to subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, hit the thumbs up below, leave a comment, hit the bell for notifications for my videos, and share the video with a friend. Your engagement and feedback helps this channel continue to improve and grow with every video. Thanks for watching.
The waist is again removed similarly as before. As you're approaching the middle, you have to be really careful to minimize tear out. If you're biting off a little more than you can chew, big chumps will come out. I ended up with a little bit myself. In traditional style, this joint doesn't get any glue, so those tear out spots could lessen the integrity of the joint. However, since this is for furniture, I'll add glue to the joint and it'll be no worse for wear. To fine tune everything and keep my 90 degree jig from sliding, I learned this trick from Dylan Iwakuni where you can spray the bottom of the jig with water before clamping it to your surface. Then it's just a matter of working your way lightly down to your baseline. When working the base of the mortise, again, work halfway down and rotate to protect your faces. The tenon portion is similarly pared down from all sides. And I will say that there is something oddly satisfying about watching a very sharp chisel just eat through end grain like that. And as you can see from the pre-glue test fit, we are snug as a bug in a rug. Back to the front apron, I'm just going to trim the ends up close on the table saw. And then those ends are just flushed up with the low angle block plane. Using the front apron as a reference piece, I'll cross cut the rear apron to that exact length. For the side aprons, I want to gang cut them, so I'll stick them together with some double sided tape. And they'll be cross cut to final length on the table saw. And after the table saw, I'll flush up the edge grain to get it square. Then separating the two pieces, I'll work on the faces with the hand plane. Then the front apron with the drawer face in place gets planed as well. As well as the rear apron. Back to the legs, I'm going to crosscut everything to final dimension, and I'm using that trusty magnetic stop against the fence again to make sure that I'm safely nailing the length. These legs are a little thicker than my taper jig can handle, so I'm using a stop block with double-sided tape on the back and a quick-release clamp to lock the workpiece to the jig. Then I'll take a pass, and as soon as the waste is released, shut the saw off as opposed to pushing through destroying my clamps, and maybe my day. After your first pass, it's a quarter turn and repeat, and you're just gonna taper two faces. And I'll repeat that process on all the legs. The tapering process leaves some pretty rough saw marks, so I'm going to smooth everything out with a high angle iron in the low angle jack plane on the hybrid leg. And if you're getting full width shavings from the rosewood maple tree, you know you're doing something right. I switched back to my smoother for the maple only legs and made some shavings perfect for the toilet paper crisis of 2020. And then with the low angle block, I'll add the tiniest of chamfers to break all the edges. My life is dope. It's so hot. To join the apron to the legs, I'm going to use the domino. Also, if you haven't noticed by now, this is the first video that actually features my new workbench in action. If you haven't seen that video, I'll have that linked in the corner above. Having the option to use Holdfast makes quick work with the domino and keeps my workpiece nice and stable. I've also got some very convenient vertical work holding options as well, which makes life a little bit easier on my back. To create a very slight and subtle offset between the legs and the apron, I'll adjust the positioning of the mortise and the legs just a few millimeters toward the center of the leg 
and then drill on two adjacent faces, essentially the faces that bear the tapers. And then everything will get brought together with the tenons and glue. Now, I brought the front and rear aprons together first before joining the rear to the front with the side aprons. With that being said, there's really no necessary order of operations here. I recall in the John Peters video that he had a very similar order of operations and that's just what I stuck with. But after actually building this thing, I can't really tell the difference. The singular tray style drawer needs runners, so a piece of maple is butt jointed to the end with Miller dowels. That'll be mounted to the rear apron and joined to the front apron by being pinned between strips of the reinforcing substrate. The drawer will be dovetailed with through dovetails in the rear and half blind dovetails directly into the drawer face. I'm not going to spend much time going through the mechanics of through dovetails as I've got a pretty detailed video on how I hand cut dovetails and I'll link that in the corner above. The ratter plane rabbit on the inside of the tails is a bit of a new move for me. It's an extremely small and subtle addition but helps hide any imperfections from the inside and gives a little ledge to assist in laying out pins on the end grain. Also, I've begun to chamfer the inside of the tails as well to allow for an ease and fit. That chamfer actually starts just past the end to maintain the squareness from the outside, but allow for a little ramp into the tails. As a quick aside, I'm using this waste board to chop out the pin sockets because I'm still trying to be nice to my workbench surface. I'm sure eventually I'll just get over that. For the half blinds, I'll use the marking gauge off the length of the tails and scribe that into the end grain of the drawer face. And then I'll mark off the actual shape of the tails. And here's a bit of a dopey snafu of sorts, where basically I started attempting to chop out the waste without sawing my pins first. Thankfully I caught it before I started really going to town. And much as I did on that leg joint, I'll saw at an angle and stay within my layout lines. The technique for removing the waist is pretty similar to that joint as well. It's also reminiscent of Christian Bexford's method for through dovetails, which I might add is a great video if you have not seen that before. I'm actually waiting on a fishtail chisel to be able to get better into the back corners of the pins. However, for now, just be careful with a small chisel. As said before, the runner is mounted to the rear apron and that's pinned at a slight angle with Miller dowels and then it'll be pinned from the underside of the front apron with a Miller dowel as well. The runners need a bottom for the drawer to actually run on so that'll be mounted to the bottom with glue and some brass twist nails just to pin it in place while the glue cures. And since the drawer is a bit long, it has a little bit of vertical play. I'll eliminate that by mounting a thin strip of maple into the top of the runners toward the front apron. That'll be screwed in and will also serve as a catch for the drawer stop, which will keep the drawer from being pulled all the way out. To accept a drawer bottom, the insides of the drawer will have a dado routed in with a quarter inch straight bit. I'm using a trim router with an edge guide to keep everything straight. The drawer bottom is just cut out from some quarter inch ply on the table saw and that'll get painted with some matte charcoal spray paint on the show side. And then the drawer is glued up and assembled. For the drawer pull, I'll mark the center of the drawer front and then using a Forstner bit and then a brad point bit, drill a two-step mortise for the pull to sit in. Onto the lathe, the pull is turned out of some ebony that was gifted to me from a friend. I haven't used the lathe in quite a while, so it was nice to have some time spindle turning the pull. I'm essentially going to turn down two sections for that double step tenon, 
so that the pole can be fit into the drawer face but have a slight reveal between the pole and the hole drilled by the Forstner bit. I went with more of a trumpeted look with the pole because I felt it would be more ergonomic, but candidly I always have a tendency to have that flare out on my turning projects and most of the bowls I've done are lit similarly. For finishing, I chucked it up like a really tiny bowl and then sanded and burnished with the shavings. And with just a little glue, I was able to set it in with a perfect friction fit. The desktop is constructed of three maple boards that were planed down to about three quarter thickness. I started by trying to orient the grain in an appealing way and also get the grain flow as best as I can in one direction. Interestingly enough, this was going to be the top, and then I changed my mind and it became the bottom. For tabletops, I tend to use the wide mortise setting on one side and the tight setting on the other to allow for ease and alignment. This will inevitably make my finish work easier with the hand planes. While the top's in the clamps, I'll drill a countersunk hole in a piece of scrap for the drawer stop and pre-drill a hole for the corresponding screw in the outside rear of the drawer. The drawer stop is designed to be adjustable so that the entire drawer can be removed if necessary. I'm adjusting it with the desktop off here from above, but it can also be done from the underside of the desk as well when the top is mounted. In preparation for the desktop, I'm drilling with a Forstner bit to accept a figure 8 fastener. I've used these fasteners before, but it had been quite a while and I forgot that they needed to be opened up a bit with a chisel on the corners to allow for enough range of motion to accommodate for seasonal wood movement. These are only drilled into the side aprons as wood expands and contracts along its width. The underside is then flattened with the jack plane, and as I said before, this ultimately became the top after some flip-flopping on what exactly looked better. I then switched from the jack plane to the low angle jack with that same 50 degree iron I had used before to deal with some squirrely cathedral grain and some unruly direction changes. The high angle iron is kind of like cheating and acts as more of a scraper, which allows it to plow through these tough to handle areas. The ends are trimmed square to the sides at a 15 degree bevel with the track saw. Then using a bevel gauge, I'll match that angle and transfer it to the table saw to rip the long edges. You might have seen me spraying the end grain before planing earlier. That's actually denatured alcohol, which softens it a touch and makes it easier to plane. And that'll help me get rid of these burn marks from the track saw with the low angle block. The finish is my often used Maloof finish. Equal parts boiled linseed oil, pure tongue oil, and wipe on poly with a splash of mineral spirits for penetration. I'll apply multiple coats of this, wiping on and wiping off excess to prevent runs and sags. Now this angle is a good demonstration of how to assess the need for continued coats. This is 24 hours after my initial application and from where the light is hitting you can see where the wood is sufficiently saturated and the more matte or dry looking areas are where the finish has really penetrated, which require more coats. You're going for an even sheen across the whole surface before moving on to stage 2 of the finish, which is the tongue oil, linseed, and beeswax blend. To assist with the drawer movement along the runners, the drawer sides and runners will get a pretty heavy dose of paste wax to allow for a smoother glide. And the top is mounted via the figure 8 fasteners, and we're done. This desk, while deceptively simple, is chock full of detail and technique. I'm pretty thrilled with the final product and candidly keep finding myself rubbing on that glassy hand plane surface. I'll be spending a lot of time at this desk editing videos and doing computer work, so it's nice to have something classic and timeless that I can work at. Also, based upon its small size, it can eventually transition to an entry table should the need arise. While this is not a pure shaker writing desk by any stretch of that definition, I will say that the principles behind the craftsmanship are quite the same. That desire and labor of love is what I hope you find here in this video. In the words of Christian Bexvoort, joy is in the details that make a difference. Thanks for watching, and as always, see you next time here at Cowdog Craftworks.